Today I'm focused on art visits Oakmoggy in the Creek Council House. This is a building that was built in 1878 and has played a major role in the history of northeastern Oklahoma. The building has just gone through a major restoration and it's an award winner. I'm Barbara Cohenauer. Stay tuned for Focus on Art. the south side of the Creek Council House and the place to meet my guest for the day, Annette Frum. Annette, welcome to Focus on Art. Thank you, Barbara. Welcome to the Council House. We appreciate being here and this is a wonderful structure and of course you've done a beautiful restoration and I understand you've won an award for that. Yes, we did. We won one of 15 National Trust Merit Awards. It's actually called a Preservation Award or something like that. It's one of 15 in the country and we were really honored by that um, because it shows the work it honors the work that went into this and the commitment by the city of Okmulgee to preserve this site. Well, I know this is a site that through the years has been uh, kind of kicked around. People have thought, well, maybe we don't need to keep this building. But now I think at the end of the 20th century, people are very happy that the city of Okmulgee decided to preserve the building that's a part of the community. Well, they are. Both the city of Okmulgee and the Creek Nation are really proud of the building and glad to see it preserved because this will be the place to learn about Creek culture and history, both for non-Creek people and for Creek people and for other Indians. And to see the significance of this tribe, which was really quite a major tribe in the Southeast and in Indian Territory and Oklahoma. And this is one of five council houses. In That's the right. State. Each of the five civilized tribes, when they were removed to Indian Territory, uh, established their own government here and set up a council house built as a western building like this but serving their governmental needs. Okay now as we look at this building uh, as we see it today it was constructed in 1878 but this is not the first building that was on this site. That's right actually when the Creek people first came here they met at a site called Council Hill because they brought this form of government with them from Georgia and Alabama. In 1868, they built a log building here. It was a two-story log building where primarily their legislature met. In 1878, they realized the building was too small, and so they built this out of native hewn stone. Um, the floorboards and the, the wood all came in from Arkansas uh, overland, and it served from 1878 until 1906 at the, the beginning of statehood when all of the Native American governments were disbanded and the Department of the Interior took over the building. Okay, now as we, we look at the front facade, tell us a little bit about some of the restoration uh, project, some of the things that have been changed and some of the things that were done in earlier restoration projects. Well, actually the restoration project, the current one that we just finished, took about five years. In 1988 they started raising the money. In 1991-92 they started doing the work and there was work done on the exterior in terms of protecting the foundations by putting in French drains, taking up the rock walkways in order to put them down as they were originally in 1878, because over the years they'd been changed. Uh, these walls, or the portion of the wall that remains, were in pretty bad condition, and the stones were taken out, were numbered, and they were remortared and put back in so that they'd be preserved uh, and put back in in the same way. You see that there's the star washers on this wall, and this is not the first restoration project. In 1900, the building was sinking in its foundation, and um, there were lots of different ideas of what to do with the building, which ranged from tearing it down to saving it. And what they did was that they inserted iron tie rods that run through the building in both directions and come out at the star washers, and through that force of the tie rods, the building's held together and the pilasters were also added. If you see pictures of the building without the pilasters and with shutters, that's pre-1900. Okay, so a building that's changed slightly on the outside for very practical reasons. Well, Annette, why don't we go inside and take a look at what's happened there. Okay. Here. 
Barbara, when you first come into the museum, what you'll see is our Red Stick Gallery, our gift shop. We're really proud of this because what we're trying to do is promote local artists and craftspeople. You can buy Southwestern stuff anywhere. You can buy it here too. But here you can also buy Choctaw and Chickasaw dolls, Seminole dolls and baskets, gourd work that's done by a Creek woman, and bead work that are done by Creek people so that we can help serve as an outlet for the local artists and people can get something different here. Great. Well, as I have traveled around Oklahoma doing Focus on Art, I certainly know that there's a need in this area for outlet for many wonderful artists. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate your efforts there. Yeah. Okay, well now we're in the sort of grand hallway. This is the main entrance to the building, uh, and this was the entry hallway. What's really interesting is that this was the house of government for the Creek people, so each room served a separate purpose. The room that's right here was the Committee on Foreign Relations. Okay, let's take a look in here. Well, Ned, as we walk into this room, I think the thing that catches our attention is this beautiful light fixture. Uh, is this an original? Actually, no, because originally the building wasn't electrified. Well, of course, I should have known that. In the specs of the building, it specifies that there were four branch candelabra that had lanterns over them. Um, these fixtures, we do believe, were original to when the building was electrified, okay. and they too were restored. They were sent out to a shop in Muskogee to be cleaned and replated and then reset back in. Well, they're just lovely. Thank you. Uh, I notice you have uh, some paintings. Are these part of your permanent collection, or is this just a temporary exhibit? This is a temporary exhibit of the work of Dana Tiger, who's an artist in Muskogee who's nationally noted. And the reason why we invited her in is that her father was Jerome Tiger, mm -hmm. uh, the late great artist who was a famous Creek Seminole artist. And in the year when we were closed for the restoration, a woman from Oklahoma donated a set of about 36 tiger prints to us. So we have the tiger prints on show now with the work of his daughter to show the family continuity. Great. Okay, now the next room that we'll be going to, into also had a purpose. What was the purpose of this room? This was the Superintendent of Public Instruction. This um, department was actually founded in the late 19th century and brought together all the mission schools and the schools that were run by the Creek Nation themselves. And it's believed, in fact, that there was a school room in this classroom. We'll talk a little bit later about the restoration, but all the plaster was stripped off of all the walls. But this is where you see the remaining plaster, or the remaining original plaster. And the reason why we think there was a school room is there's some graffiti here, some somebody or somebody's etched numbers, and there's a few initials into this plaster work. Uh, right here we look like we have four, five, six. Uh, this might have been for students in rather uh, low grade. That's right, and there's some scattered twos and other numbers. But this also allows visitors to see the original plaster work that was here. Okay, now this is plaster over rock wall. That's yeah, right. Here. They're solid rock walls. They're about two feet thick. Okay, well, the next thing I have a question about is this hole in the wall over here, Annette. What was this used for? Well, the room that you see through the pass-through was the National Treasurer's Room. And this pass-through was the uh, way in which allotments or monthly money or shoes were handed to the Creek people. So this was a pay area. And in interpreting the building, we'll show how this worked and what the function was of it. Now, in this room, we have a collection of, what can we say, the earliest artifacts that you have from the museum. Well, part of the restoration involved an excavation. And as the construction, construction crew was working, two archaeology students from the University of Tulsa came down and worked with them in the okay. excavation. When they took the floorboards down, actually these, act, uh, these actual floorboards up, they found the original foundations from the 1868 building. And we took several stones out of that, stones that were no longer in the foundation itself, so we didn't break into the integrity of it. And that's what you find there. As it was a log building, that's some of the chinking. And somewhere along the way, there was graffiti, although this is just scratching on it, and original nails and the piece of a tool that broke off in the original construction, or we think broke off, it was in between several of the stones of the foundation. Then the students continued working with the crew, and when they started working on the ceiling between the first and second floors, they found that 
A workman in 1878 had put his ads down among the floorboards, and the next workman came and closed it up there. <laughs> okay. And so we found this wonderful ads with wood shavings by it. We have copies from the Oklahoma Historical Society of the specifications for the original building, and included in it were lightning rods. That was mm -hmm. necessary here. Certainly. And when the exterior was excavated for the French drains, they found these grounds for the lightning rods, which proves there were lightning rods then. But the most fun item we all thought was the pack rat's nest. The attic was all full of lots of detritus junk. And there was a pack rat's nest with all sorts of paper and other materials in it that point to different parts of the history. You know, I mean, just historic items from the time. But in the 10 years that the Department of the Interior owned the building, the building served as the county courthouse. And everybody was really excited when they found these guilty and not guilty slips that possibly came from that time period. One of the founders of the nonprofit organization that runs the museum was Orlando Swain. Mm -hmm. He served many purposes in the city, including being the mayor. And there's a blotter from an insurance company that was Jolly and Swain. And other material that the pack rat wanted to keep, the Okmulgee Hotel, business cards, lots of envelopes with dates and a stamp collect collector would like to get his hand in there, and items like that. So it does preserve the history of the activities of the building. Well, I think it's just wonderful that the pack rat uh, ended up being the collector for this major yes. museum. Well, now this pretty much covers what we have on the first floor. So we want to go to the second floor. And really, when the building was used as a council house, the main activities did go on in the, on the second floor. That's right. The two rooms of the legislation were upstairs, as was the Supreme Court. OK. And then I think one of the most interesting and lovely architectural features of this building, of course, is this wonderful staircase. And I'm sure this was a very difficult part of the restoration. It was, Barbara, both first in deciding how to restore it and what to restore, and then the actual physical work. Um, but Doug Groves, who's the engineer with the city, will be with us in a few minutes to tell you exactly what happened with it more specifically than I could. Great, okay. Now on this second floor we have three major rooms. The one we're in now is used for which purpose? The Supreme Court. This was for the judicial section of the government. Uh, the way it was set up is that there were six districts in Creek Nation and they functioned independently but then the major cases came here to Supreme Court. Okay, and the other two big rooms up here were used for what? Well, the legislation. It was a bicameral or a two-part, two-body legislation, just like that of the United States. Okay. Yes. Now we have some wonderful photographs in here. Let's take a look at these. They kind of tell the history of this building. That's right. Um, the building was, this building was built in 1878, but it was preceded by a log building that was built in 1868. Um, and as I said below, downstairs, it grew to be too small, and so it was dismantled or gotten rid of somehow. There's dispute on that. Um, and so we've got some pictures that illustrate that. Um, we start out here with an ox cart. I guess they're bringing the logs in. For well, the right. The records that I had with this photo is that these are the actual logs, but I wouldn't swear on that. <laughs> but at least it sets the theme, and you know how that mechanically was done. This is the actual building itself, the 1868 building. Uh, in 1875, this was a major intertribal uh, convention that brought Indians from all over Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory, and you can tell the difference from their appearance and their dress. Um, there were plans to make Oklahoma the state of Sequoia. It would have been an all Native American state, but that never came to fruition. Other photos show changes made to the building and so forth and give evidence to uh, the, the shutters and what it looked like before 1900, before the pilasters and the star washes were added. Um, as we move along, we can also see the state of the, of the uh, roads in Okmulgee. <laughs> All right. When, and also the mode of transportation. Um, the uh, horse cart in the photo up here was from one of the local drug stores. Uh, we can see that just as today, uh, the council house is a gathering place for young people. So it was uh, at the turn of the century. You can also see how the trees grow and how the trees change. Um, 
One thing I noticed in that, Annette, uh, are the utility poles. Now, I didn't see that when we were uh, outside looking at the building. A major part of the restoration in returning it to its original state was to bury all the utilities and get rid of the huge um, air conditioning units and things like that. Oh, that was a wonderful thing to do. So Much there's no more wires outside. Um, I mentioned downstairs that in 1906 the building became the property of the, of the uh, federal government and the county ran it. And the county sheriff's office was here. If, if you were here and were taller, you could see on the calendar this picture is dated 1913. They uh, heated with uh, coal burning stoves or wood burning stoves. What was fun in the restoration is that all the doors of the building were stripped. And if you look down, there's a small photo that we found the door that said County Sheriff. So this really goes to document that photo and show that the Sheriff's Office was here. There were different movements to have this building torn down. Some of the town fathers felt that it was an eyesore, felt that there should be a hotel in this, um, uh, the town square, because Okmulgee rivaled Tulsa as an oil capital. So what happened in about 1919 was that there was an underground plan and part of the exterior wall was torn down, the perimeter wall. And it was neat because we found in our archives before and after. And what happened was that with the wall being torn down, the town sentiment was totally turned around and decided that they needed to save the building. Great. I'm a lover of architecture. And the fact that anyone would even have thought of tearing this building down, of course, is just a frightening one. And in 19, 1926, Will Rogers said you can find an owl drugstore, which you can't anymore, in any town in Oklahoma, but you can only find the Creek Council House in Okmulgee. Uh, see, it proves what a wise man. That's right. Will Rogers really was. That's right. Other photos show the use that this building was put to while it, after it became city property. The Public Health Association was housed here with a free clinic. Um, for those people who know cars, they can tell me what date these are. I couldn't even tell you what a 1994 car looked like. I um, bet those are early 20s. I'll let you do that. You can also see the cupola and the, um, the eagle on top of the cupola, the eagle um, weather vane, which was part of the original specifications. The building was the Red Cross, War Housing Center, uh, the YWCA, uh, there are people in town who still remember coming up here for dances, and there was the Indian Museum, the Okmulgee um, Chamber of Commerce was housed here. Many of these institutions were here at the same time, so there were multiple offices in the building. In 1964, we were placed on the National Register for Historic Places as a national landmark. And in about 1972, the building was exclusively made over to be a museum, as it remains today. Wonderful. Well, now, I think the next person we want to talk to is Doug. Yes. And uh, I believe he's out by the stairwell, where he spent a good bit of time working on that restoration. Barbara, here's Doug Groves coming up. And he'll give us some more detail about the restoration. Um, and perhaps give you some of the background to the choices we made in restoring the stairs and how we did Hi. that. How are you? Hi, Doug. Welcome to Focus on Art. Thank you. Well, Doug, I know this was a major project right here at the stairwell. So yes. why don't we start? You had some hands-on experience in putting this back together and let you tell us what happened. Yes. Uh, a major decision in the building was uh, replacing the floor joist. The floor joist and the flooring is actually the support structure. Mm -hmm. for the staircase. So in, in demoing that, that required us to shore the historic staircase in place and put the new flooring back. If we were building this building today, we'd probably start and put in some kind of support for the stairs and then put the stairs on top of that rather than letting it rest right on the floor. Is that what your yes, problem was, basically? Right, it's just the details. We had to just trace the steps that they had and support okay. the stair, what was very important was to support the stair how it was originally supported. Okay, and so you did that, and then I think you were telling me uh, a little bit earlier that there was a little problem with the stair shifting out from the wall? Yes, we actually had to uh, just try to jack them horizontally uh, back towards the plaster wall. Uh, and uh, just this animal is gonna move in different ways, so you've got to move it back into the right, right place. 
it's just very challenging and it's uh, uh, rather heavy and uh, uh, you have to be careful at the same time. All right. Now I notice you have a different kind of, of treads over there than you have over here. Those look much older over there. What's the, why did you choose two different types here? Those are the historic side. We, uh, it was very important in, in keeping, uh, those are uh, historic fabric. It's very important to, to retain those in the shape that they were in today. And uh, we, we felt that they were very, uh, very hazardous. And mm -hmm. uh, in, in keeping with that, we decided to uh, replace just the stair treads themselves. And that made for a very uh, more safe and secure staircase to go up and down. So you have one staircase to use and one to let us know what it was really like. Exactly. Okay. Of course, this banister is beautiful. Is this original? Yes. It all is original and uh, uh, meticulously stripped and, uh, and restained and finished. Okay. What is this uh, rod that goes across right here by the staircase? It's a rod that actually goes completely through the building from one side to the other and uh, is attached with big stars and, and bolts on the outside and actually holding the building together okay. at the center point of the building. Well, we saw the stars when we were outside. Mm -hmm. So this is the tie rod that's really literally holding the building together. Yes, and it was, uh, it was not done originally. They started having structural problems and the pilasters and, and the rods were put in at a later date. Oh, okay. And that's actually what's been holding this thing together for some time. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, now you've got some great photographs over here that show the uh, building as it was in progress of being restored. Tell us a little bit about what's happening in these, Doug. In this picture, we had just gotten started. Uh, and you can see where some of the old sidewalks uh, and flagstone were. And that's we started to remove those. Uh, the arches were in non-historic. Uh, they were not original. Those were added just for convenience oh, okay. uh, at one time. And so we were required to, uh, to, to remove those. Doug, what are they doing to the wall of the building here? We're removing the stone uh, because they were stressed due to where the utility lines used to be connected to the side of the building. We're just tearing those down and then reinstalling them in the same locations. Okay, and this is the polyester that they added in the first re restoration, pictured here, is that right? And yes. this is the tie rod? Yeah, that's actually the end of the rod, and that's just a star is a big washer and a nut on the end of it. That's okay. how they tightened it up. So it's just like the one that we have in the floor here. Yes. Uh, that's where it comes out. Right. Okay, great. Well, let's see, as we walk along here, it looks like in this photograph they're working on that walk again. Yes, that's the the historic flagstone was just laid directly on the dirt and um, had numerous problems and uh, we're just taking them up at that point and uh, as you move on to the the other pictures we're actually just going in and setting them on a, a normal concrete sidewalk and they'll be very well supported and uh, oh that's going to be a great improvement okay now in this photograph uh, it looks like we have a corner of the wall that's still standing. This was left over after the town fathers decided to tear down the wall way back in the 20s, right? Yes, uh, just after that, they rebuilt the corner, or they in, rebuilt the corner pieces. And uh, this is a, a one on the southeast corner of the site, uh, and just shows our uh, what we had to to repair. And so those were photographed and uh, put on a normal concrete foundation, and then meticulously uh, put back into the exact same locations. Wonderful. Okay, now you have one more group of photographs which shows the floor uh, restoration. And let me guess, this is the tie rod running through the floor. Mm -hmm. It's a turnbuckle uh, joining two pieces together. You can imagine them trying to bring something 75 feet inside. It's just got pieces when they fold them out. Okay. And then tighten them all up. And in some of our uh, restorations of the floor, we just ran across those. Wonderful. Okay, now over here, it looks to me like you're down in the foundation of the building. Yes, uh, the, the pockets that you see is actually where the floor joists uh, ran through and would bear on the, on the center foundations. And what we needed to do, and mostly why they had deteriorated, was the dirt was just right on the bottom of them. And so right. we came down and excavated uh, 
18 inches below the bottom of the joist. Okay, so in this photograph, you can actually see where you've been digging down to give that extra uh, room for the new joists. And uh, what, what do we have laying out in here, Doug? In 1868, there was a building that was erected right, right inside this building. Okay. And they had burned down, and that's actually uh, pieces of the original foundation. It was built in 1868, it was a log cabin. So we documented, was able to document uh, the size of the, the structure and, and verify really what happened with the old structure, that it had burned down. Well, actually having that floor out became a very uh, convenient, uh, almost tool in finding out the history of the site in the area then. It was very interesting. Uh, and at the same time, we had an archaeologist on site that was uh, very enthused at our findings and, and documented them. Great. Now, this series of pictures tells us about the plaster work that you had to do. Um, in this picture, you just you see the the stone walls, how they were done, and the, your plaster system was done right over that. Uh, this is actually, actually the second coat. This is the first coat of plaster, which is just called the uh, the scratch coat, and it's a three coat plaster system, and. Uh, it's just the uh, three coats to eventually level the wall out and have a smooth surface. Well, Doug, I really appreciate your taking time to go through these photographs You're with welcome. us. Thank you. And My showing pleasure. us uh, what, what work you had to do to put this back. And I think it's really exciting that you even got to do some of the hands-on things. Yes, it's been a very, uh, very exciting process, and, and uh, I learned a lot from it. I enjoyed it very much. Well, Annette, have we seen everything? Not quite. Barbara, there's one more historic thing, item in the building that you need to know about, because not everybody gets to see it, and that's the bell. You know, in the cupola outside, yes. there's a bell. All and right. this is part of the original specifications when the building was built in 1878. It's a cast, I think, brass bell. It's interesting because the date of it is cast in it, but it's not really accessible to the weak at heart nor the general public. But well, we thought you'd like to have a hand at it and try ringing it. Oh, great. I'd love to have a chance. Annette, let me thank you for being here for Focus on Art. We've really enjoyed being at the Creek Council House. For those of you at home, we appreciate your being with us, as always, for Focus on Art. And now the bell. The bell. <laughs>